All right, everybody, um, we're going to do the next video um, regarding early electric lighting history. Um, this week, we are going to discuss Westinghouse. Uh, this is an interesting one um, for me and for a lot of collectors, just because there is so much uh, misinformation out there. A lot of it stems around... Um, a certain Nikola Tesla, um, who, who was important, but uh, we're not going to talk a whole lot about him uh, with this segment. We will get into that later. Um, so Westinghouse entered the electric lighting industry fairly late compared to some of his competitors like Hiram Maxim, Edward Weston, uh, etc. Um, and really, it was at the urge of a certain uh, William Stanley Jr., who was working on an AC system, um, and around 1884, um, started manufacturing incandescent lamps, um, as well as designed a transformer, really the first successful transformer uh, for the use in the United States for electric lighting um, power uh, transmission and reduction. Uh, he had based his design on the English uh, transformer of Goulard and Gibbs, um, and really, uh, without, um, without William Stanley's uh, work in, in, in AC transmission, uh, Westinghouse may not have uh, actually uh, started um, promoting uh, AC current. So what we're showing here um, are some early Stanley lamps. Um, this study right here from the Franklin Institute uh, in 1885, they did a round of testing, uh, testing different early lamp manu or period lamp manufacturers, including Edison, Weston, Woodhouse and Rawson from England, and Stanley Thompson lamps. So see here, these are uh, the based forms of Stanley Thompson lamps, which there is an example right here. Um, this particular example here has an original label that was once attached to it. Uh, it states one of Philadelphia PA's first um, type of electric light bulbs, um, and they discuss that grandma and grandpa brought it back. Um, so often, not often, but sometimes we find early lamps like this with labels like this that give us an idea of, of what they are. You have to be careful. Some of them, uh, as we may see in later videos, uh, are somewhat exaggerated and not very accurate. Um, but this one, this one makes sense. Um, so, moving from there, these, this early wood base was not very practical. Um, and by the time edit, I'm sorry, uh, Stanley was involved in, with Westinghouse, uh, he had moved on to this design here. And there's the patent for it right there. And this really is the start of the Westinghouse base. So you'll see that this looks like an English style um, platinum hook eye lamp. Um, but actually these loops are, are not meant to catch into a spring, but rather to meet tabs within a socket. And this is not a very good picture, but this is an early drawing of how this worked. And these little loops make contact with a, with a little spring tab there. Um, but the glass ridge that you'll see at the base of this lamp um, was to receive the grips of a socket very much like we know today of what the more common Westinghouse socket to be. So this really is the first Westinghouse light bulb. Um, this example here, uh, to my knowledge, is the only example known um, and uh, survives today. So it would be early 1886. Uh, definitely very expensive to make, um, complex to form the glass, so uh, they went to a more conventional base quite quickly. Um, this base is also a transitional form. Um, you'll see that there is a, uh, sorry, there is a center screw here um, with wood as an insulator. Um, the socket for this bulb really is, has not been found. You'll see this other early drawing shows a similar idea, but instead of the socket shell being a conductor, there are two screws. Um, but this would have used a similar um, method as, as the first lamp with a spring tab touching the, 
the contact. A few of these have turned up, um, but definitely something made for a very brief period of time. Um, from there, the Westinghouse base started to become standardized. And this is where um, uh, Henry Billsby and Philip Lang, also early Westinghouse employees, became really important. They designed this base. Um, and you'll see it's very much like the um, Westinghouse base, as, as most people know it. Um, the pin is not straight. It has sort of a, almost a bowling pin shape. Um, most of these um, have a purple colored glass insulation. Um, this example here is, is much more of a transitional piece with a wood insulator. Um, these lamps have a filament, I don't know if we'll be able to zoom in and see it, kind of can, of carbonized thread, reminiscent of what Edison did in October of 1879, but Westinghouse actually uh, did find success in, in using that filament, or Stanley rather, really. Um, this is the socket. Um, this was designed by um, Philip Lang, uh, Franklin Leonard Pope, and Henry Billsby. Um, it is the first type of socket that would have it accepted what we now know as a standard Westinghouse uh, base. So an interesting thing happened in, in Westinghouse in about 1887 and, eight, well, 1888. Um, in 1886, Edison started suing all of his competitors who had infringed on his patents, which those patents being, well, it'll be important for where we're going a little bit later, um, a high resistance filament in a complete vacuum or a completely fused glass envelope with a high vacuum with platinum wire entering into the glass to provide electrical conductivity. And basically that covered everybody who was now making light bulbs and all of them were found to be infringing. Um, there was an inventor by the name of William Sawyer who uh, was an early competitor of Edison starting about 1878. And William Sawyer um, got into an argument with uh, somebody at a bar over uh, Edison's patent rights and wound up shooting the guy. Uh, never states whether the guy died or not, um, but William um, Sawyer died in jail in 1883. Um, the lamps that he made were never conventional. They would have never likely been a success. However, when he died, his wife sold the patents, and anybody who felt they could use any of that uh, to circumvent Edison's patents did so. Uh, one of those patents described a filament in the shape of a horseshoe. Um, in this case, um, this lamp is, it's hard to see, but it is marked Sawyer Man on the base. Um, Westinghouse purchased the rights to use the Sawyer Man name in 1888. And you can see this is basically your typical later Billsby Lang base with glass insulation. Uh, there is nothing different about this than, than this lamp or this, um, it is simply just a decoy to try and claim uh, acceptable use of patents that that, that, it was, it, that wouldn't infringe upon Edison's. Regardless, this was an infringing lamp and all they really did was change, put a name on it. Um, so by about 1890, um, oh, well, by 1890, uh, by 1888, um, all lamps made by Westinghouse were labeled as Sawyer Man. And if you were to look into an early Westing, I'm sorry, Sawyer Man catalog of that era, it would state George Westinghouse as the president. By about 1890, um, the Westinghouse base has a straight pin. So you'll see that this example still has very much the rounded bottom of the outer shell, like the Billsby Lang, but has a straight pin. So somewhat of a transitional piece. Um, while unmarked, this is a, a Sawyer Man lamp made by Westinghouse. Um, slightly later, Sawyer Man lamp, also made by Westinghouse, within a year or two of the prior. Um, jumping back a bit, uh, kind of the, the king of all early Westinghouse lamps, the factory lamp. So this lamp was designed uh, by William Stanley, patented in 1886. 
and it has 275 uh, candle power filaments and it was designed so that the socket would have one common and then two conductors to each filament so that it could be wired so that you could turn on either one filament or both generally the whole facility would be would be set up that way for for two different light levels uh, make it, with both of them on you'd have 150 candle power um, most examples of this that are known to survive um, are slightly later and labeled as being uh, Sawyer Man. So they, they post-date that about mid-1888 um, when the Sawyer Man patents were purchased by Westinghouse and thus used on, on all um, Westinghouse products or Westinghouse electric lighting products. Um, so this is the sort of the the iconic Westinghouse stopper. So um, outside of light bulb collectors, uh, one of the most known early light bulbs would be the Westinghouse stopper. So in 1892, Westinghouse outbid Edison to light the um, Columbian exhibition, the 1893 World's Fair. Also in 1892, Edison won all of his patent litigation and all infringers were ordered to stop production um, immediately, to which Westinghouse was, was one of them. So Westinghouse had to come up with an idea or a lamp that would not infringe on Edison's patents. Um, little side note, often this work is credited to Nikola Tesla. Uh, Tesla had no um, involvement uh, with the design of this lamp. He was no longer working at Westinghouse at this time and the design is patented under George Westinghouse himself. The concept of the Westinghouse stopper is that it avoids infring infringing on Edison's patents um, by not using a one-piece glass envelope where the neck has a ground taper inside into which a glass-shaped stopper is glued in. Uh, you can imagine the glue or tar material that they had at that time was not very, uh, not very good. And, of course, these produce heat. Um, so the warmer they got, the softer the adhesive got, and eventually they, uh, they would lose their vacuum. Uh, there's also no platinum used in the stem press of these lamps. So the, the um, wire entering um, is iron. And we'll zoom in here, this example, and you'll see that there are a lot of small bubbles around the iron wire, which is the problem, you know, which is platinum was, was valued in this case because platinum expanded and extracted at the same rate as glass. So it would make an airtight seal, uh, which was part of Edison's patents, uh, patent. However, Geisler had done it earlier, uh, it was never patented. Um, so the length of this stopper would hopefully uh, allow those bubbles to, to uh, eventually seal um, with enough surface area of glass that didn't have bubbles around it. All in all, this was a pretty poor design. It got um, uh, Westinghouse to the World's Fair. They were changing out light bulbs like crazy. Um, we're showing three examples here just because it shows in that short period of time of 1892, late 1892 to 1892, for that they produce this, they really were trying a lot of different things. Uh, this example, the adhesive is, is a very dark color. There is uh, a black painted plaster filler in the bottom. And then the two pins at the bottom, which are, are the stopper base, have a uh, divider, an insulator to hold them apart. Uh, this example is a little simpler, just has a little red fiber disc in there. And this example is very unusual in that it has a porcelain divider to hold the pins apart. Now this base, in most cases, most of these lamps are found today with an adapter like this. Um, this would allow the stopper base to go into a Thomson Houston socket. There's Westinghouse. They made these for United States Electric, Edison bases, ironically enough, Brush Swan, etc. Um, this is a very interesting stopper lamp in that the stopper itself is milk glass. Uh, there is no mention of this form anywhere. Um, um, 
And so maybe some more research will reveal some more information about it, but definitely a unique piece. Um, this is the brochure that would have been given out at um, the World's Fair in 1893. Uh, interestingly enough, the, uh, the book refers to these as Sawyer Man Stopper Lamps. However, you will see on this original label here, it clearly says Westinghouse. And it seems to be at the last minute, uh, they, they changed the labeling of, of how they marketed these. Uh, in most cases, knowing it was such a poor design, uh, it would have tarnished the, um, the, 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 the good name of, of Sawyer Man. How, however, uh, Westinghouse replaced the name with his own. Um, uh, interesting call. Um, so this is an interesting piece here, moving on, but still related to the stopper lamp. Oh, uh, we'll jump back for a second. This is the original socket for a stopper lamp. Um, there, were, there was a proprietary socket for this base. Um, and uh, in cases where people didn't purchase adapters, uh, they could purchase this socket uh, for their installation. Wouldn't have been a great idea because, uh, sorry about that. Wouldn't have been a good idea um, because uh, two years later, he kind of would have had a problem. They had a way around that. We'll get to that in a second. Um, so this lamp turns up, or this form turns up now and then. Uh, and this is labeled as a Sawyer Man, uh, right on the label. Um, collectors in the past have referred to this as a Sawyer Man stopper lamp. Uh, it certainly has a similar tapered stem to a stopper lamp. Um, it has a similar glass bead here at the top that looks like the stopper envelope, very heavy like that of a stopper envelope. Uh, it took a little bit of research to find out what this was, but in 1895, Westinghouse was once again allowed to infringe upon Edison's patents because Edison's patents expired in 1894, and they could go back to manufacturing a conventional lamp, fully fused glass envelope, um, platinum through the stem press, etc. What this is, is actually, this is a stopper envelope. Um, interesting that, that the insulation at the bottom is clear glass. It's a stopper envelope um, with, um, th that was recycled. So to make use of their inventory of an envelope for, for, for a light bulb that was pretty inefficient and low life, um, they used, the, they used a, a special blown glass stem that would fit into the taper. It would have been fully sealed at the bottom. Um, and uh, so just kind of a, a weird transitional piece, kind of the aftermath of, of the whole stopper uh, lamp saga. Um, so finally, for the light bulbs, this is an interesting piece in that if you had purchased these sockets uh, when the stopper lamp was being made, once it was no longer made, your socket could still be used by using a lamp that had a stopper base. So this did not sell well. Very few of these are known to exist. But this is a later lamp in the era of 1895-96 that was made with a base that would fit into the stopper socket, but an otherwise conventional lamp. Um, so we'll just show a few other pieces here. Um, like Edison, Westinghouse also, or all the manufacturers, had to come up with some of their own apparatus. Um, here is an early Westinghouse voltmeter. This was designed by Oliver Schallenberger. Um, the first Westinghouse watt hour meter for recording energy use was also designed by Schallenberger and seen right here. And there's the cover for it. And then you had the switches. It's a fairly large high amperage one. Fuse blocks for the system. These are all Westinghouse. Uh, this was a fused service cutout, so this would have gone uh, between the power feed and equipment like the uh, like a meter and allow you to safely uh, remove this pin uh, to disconnect the service while servicing any apparatus. Um, and then we have just a more residential sized wall switch for probably rated three to five lights. So um, that wraps up Westinghouse. Um, and thank you all for joining.